Good morning once again, church family. We are so glad that you've joined us this Sunday for the Sunday morning sermon. Uh, we're getting close to the end of May here. June's right around the corner. And uh, we're still in this situation where we are told we cannot meet together uh, in groups in church. But it looks like that's uh, going to change very soon. So let's keep praying. Uh, we want to get back together. We want to fellowship with our friends and loved ones. And uh, I know that uh, you want to do that, too. So continue to pray and believe with us. For the meantime, we are doing our Sunday morning sermons online. And I know that uh, this has blessed some who cannot come to church. Um, and this has blessed some who are in different parts of the world that you may not have access to a church that really is preaching the word of God. So we want to welcome you all over the world, everyone that's joining us right now. We're glad to have you with our family. This is the family of Shoreline Full Gospel Fellowship in Seattle, Washington. And uh, it's just nice to be able to reach out to some of our friends that are in different parts of the world. So uh, before we begin now, um, I just want to say that if you have missed any of the previous sermons, you can listen to those online. You can go to our website, shorelinefullgospel.org. Also, uh, our YouTube channel, Shoreline Full Gospel. Um, you can also see them on my YouTube channel, my personal YouTube channel, which is Tom Loud. So if you've missed those, please look those up. I know that you'll get something out of them. I want to thank everybody who has been so supportive. I want to thank our church family who's been so supportive and patient during this time. Uh, we got to still continue to pray, to lift each other up to support each other in every way. I thank those of you who have supported us in prayer, supported us financially, supported us in any way. Uh, we just wanna say thank you. We appreciate you. And so uh, before we begin today's message, which is called The Environment of a Great Harvest, I want to turn it over to my brother, Reverend Aaron Baker, for a little time of worship. God bless you and joy. Hallelujah. Welcome. Once again, it's time to praise the Lord. I am excited this morning because we get to lift him up and give him the glory he so properly deserves. So I invite you just to lift your hearts and your minds and center your attention on him while we do so. Before, we're going to uh, lift up the Lord and uh, just, just thank him. So Father, we just thank you for this wonderful opportunity to worship you, to praise you, to love you, and to acknowledge you. We ask you, Lord, to take what we bring you today, Lord, and do what you will with it. Use it mightily and fill us with your living word. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, 
what's your wrong? Still I will give myself away to make you know the name above all other names is yours alone. There is none like you. There is none like you, none like you, the faithful one, Jesus. There is none like you, none like you, the faithful one, Jesus. Thank you, Aaron. That was really a wonderful song. I really appreciate you, brother. So today, uh, the title of our message is The Environment of a Great Harvest. Last week, we discovered some wonderful things about what Jesus calls mustard seed faith. And if you missed that, you can just check that out. Go back uh, to last week's message and review that. And I think you're going to find some things that are really eye-opening. But we found some things uh, last week about a mustard seed, about the mustard seed that Jesus talked about anyway, and that it was not the size of the seed that determined the harvest. That's true with every seed. Some seeds are large and produce a small plant. Some seeds are small and produce a large plant. So the seed size does not determine the size of your harvest when it is fully matured. You know, uh, Jesus talks about a mustard seed, says, Though it's the smallest of seeds in the garden, it creates the greatest of shrubs. So the size of the seed does not really matter. We also found that everyone desires a good crop, a large crop, a healthy crop, but only those that plant and water can expect any kind of crop at all. You see, you can have the seed, but it's up to you to do something with the seed that you've been given. You must plant the seed. You must water the seed. And the Bible says this, that one man plants and other waters. So men are planting, men are watering, but it is God who gives the increase. God does not give the increase to nothing. He gives the increase to those things that have been planted and watered. So we have to do our part. When we do our part, God does the miracle of multiplication, the miracle of growth, the miracle of increase. We found that when we do our part, God will do his part and give us the increase. So once you've taken a short course on farming, do you suppose you're ready to be a farmer? I mean, all you really need to know is this, right? We learned all you need to know is that uh, you get seed, you plant it, you water it, and 
voila, you get a harvest. Well, that's not exactly how everything works. There's a little bit more to it than that, as you well know. So um, no one in my life has ever accused me of having a green thumb, all right? So I wouldn't say that I have a cursed thumb, but I just wouldn't say that I have a green thumb. I would say that I have an uneducated thumb rather than a green thumb. So here's what I mean. I love beautiful gardens. I really enjoy the garden. I find gardens peaceful and pleasant and a wonderful pr place to, to pray. You know, you can kind of get away from all the hustle and bustle and all the action and find this place that's a little bit of paradise. So I love gardens. I have been in many beautiful gardens in different parts of the world. Um, some are natural, some are planted by man, but a garden is just such a heavenly place to be. It's a heavenly place to spend some time. Now I've been drawn to gardens since I was a little boy, when, just when I was able to walk because my grandmother had beautiful gardens in her backyard. She had a beautiful flower garden that I used to love to walk through, especially early in the morning. You know, when the sun was just rising and dew was in all the flowers and the bees are just floating from flower to flower. It was just such a peaceful place. And I would sense there something that was an atmosphere of such peacefulness and otherworldliness, which I now, I, I now know that I was sensing God's presence. Now, I didn't know God. But as a child, there was something special about this place where I felt the presence of God. And it, years later, I understood that. But as a child, I just knew I liked it. Uh, my love for gardens does not necessarily guarantee me having a great garden because you have to have some knowledge. You got to know what you're doing. Okay. So uh, loving a beautiful garden does not make you qualified to necessarily have a beautiful garden. You need to know a few things. It's not any different than if you say, well, I really love food. That does not make you perhaps a great chef. You need to know, know a few things. And if you say, I really love uh, this painting, it doesn't necessarily mean you're a great artist. It just means you have an appreciation for the art. So gardening is the same way, is we can love a beautiful garden, doesn't make you a good gardener. You have to know the principles of gardening. You have to know the principles of planting, watering, and reaping. I personally have gone many times, my wife and I have gone to nurseries and we've picked out beautiful plants that we thought would look great in our garden. I have dug the hole in the ground. Uh, I have uh, put the water in the hole, put the plant in the hole, filled the hole up. And guess what? Some of those plants flourish and some of those plants die. Unfortunately, I plant them the same way, but some flourish and some simply have died. And why do you suppose some flourish and some die? Because when I got them, when they were in their pot, they seemed pretty healthy. So it wasn't like I was planting a sickly plant. These plants were healthy. I put them in the ground and they died. Something's wrong. Well, what's wrong? I lacked knowledge about certain things. And when you lack knowledge about certain things, it's very possible that you will do certain things incorrectly. Well, I lacked knowledge. And of course, Hosea 4, 6 tells us this. It's because of a lack of knowledge, people perish. Well, in my case, for a lack of knowledge, plants were perishing. So I needed more knowledge. Without good and full knowledge of how things grow, um, it worked like this. I saw plants that I liked. I planted them. I watered them. They died anyway. But why? There was something else that I wasn't addressing many times. And this is a very important thing about the health of plants. It's not only the fact that you plant it in good soil and that you water it, but it has to do with the environment you plant it in. It has to do with the place you plant this plant. Some plants thrive in full sunlight. Some plants cannot handle full sunlight and will die in full sunlight. You have to know that about the particular plant before you plant it. Some plants thrive in acidic soil and some plants die in acidic soil. Some thrive in alkaline soil and some die in alkaline soil. You've got to know some things about that specific plant before you can successfully plant it and have it thrive. Well, I wasn't taking into uh, account the environment. I wasn't taking into account 
the type of soil. I wasn't taking into account the amount of sunlight. I wasn't taking into account the temperature because there's certain regions where you can grow a palm tree and there's other regions where that tree will not grow because there's not enough sun. There's certain places where plants will grow in the very, very coldest environment, but they do not do well in a warm environment. The atmosphere, the environment makes a big difference as to whether your plant is going to thrive or die. Now let's talk once again about mustard seed faith. Mustard seed faith is something we learned last week and we learned that it could produce an enormous results. But even a good seed needs to be planted and needs to be planted in the right environment and needs to be watered. It says that if we plant and water, if we plant correctly, and if we water, God will give it the increase. So have you ever experienced planting your mustard seed of faith and not seeing a great increase? Perhaps it uh, was a small increase. Perhaps it, there was no increase at all. Have you ever encountered that problem? Perhaps the problem was the environment in which that seed was planted. Um, like I said, some plants need a, a more humid climate. Some need a drier climate. Some you can water but some you can water too much. Some plants do better if they're watered a little. And if you water them too much, thinking, you know, water's a good thing. Plants love water. So I'm just going to drench this thing. Some plants will die if you water them too much. You have to know the environment in which that plant thrives. And you have to provide that seed or that plant with that same environment for it to grow. Well, that includes our faith. There is an environment in which faith will thrive. And there's another environment where faith will not produce much of anything at all. So when talking about faith, what is the proper environment for mustard seed to thrive in? That mustard seed of faith. Well, the Bible makes it clear. We don't have to be uninformed because the Word of God instructs us on how to correctly plant this seed called faith. And we touched on it in last week's message, so let's turn now to Galatians 5, 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Now, the part talking about circumcision is this. It's talking about the Jews. It's saying it doesn't matter if you're a Jew. It doesn't matter if you're a Gentile. But you got to understand this, that faith works in the atmosphere of love. That is the environment in which your seed will thrive. The seed of faith only produces its good crop when it is planted in the environment of love. Love makes faith work. Faith that worketh by love is what that scripture said. Love is the proper atmosphere where faith produces its greatest results. And Matthew 13, 7 through 8 says this. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the seedlings. Still other seed fell on good soil and produced a crop. Now listen, it says 160 and 30 fold. You know, the seed that we have been given is the good seed of the word of God. And by faith, we plant this seed. And the Bible says that if we plant it in the right environment, it will give an increase. But it also says this. It says that some, sometimes that increase is not the same as other times. Sometimes some people plant this thing, this seed of faith, and they get 30 times what they planted. And somebody else plants it and gets 60 times. And somebody else gets 100 times. So what makes the difference? Because I certainly want the 100-fold return and not the 30-fold, even though 30 is good. 100 is a far better thing, isn't it? So what's the difference? Well, nothing wrong with the seed, nothing wrong with the water, but the environment makes all the difference. If you plant it in the best environment, you'll get the best return. Many seeds are capable of growing in, in a variety of environments, but you will find that some environments cause it to produce more fruit or more gain than other environments. Some are better than others. I want to make sure that we're planting this seed of faith, this mustard seed, in the right place, in the right way, and watering it properly so that we can see the greatest return. Well, as I said, the environment where faith does its best is the environment of love, not just any kind of love, but we're talking about God's love, agape love. Knowing to a greater degree God's love for you, knowing his care for you, knowing his concern for your needs will increase the output of your harvest. Knowing that is is his heart's desire to bless you because he loves you will encourage that seed to produce more. 
knowing God's eagerness to pardon you because he loves you and wants to break down any wall of separation between you and him is something that will cause an environment where God's seed of faith will truly produce more. And I'm looking for it to produce more. Now, this is a big statement, but I, I really mean it. I really believe it's scripturally founded. And that's this. If you are absolutely certain of how much God loves you, even more than you love yourself, and if you could begin to believe and grasp that he actually has pleasure in giving you the good things of his kingdom, and he actually enjoys giving his children good gifts because he loves us so much, it would be very, very difficult for you to doubt his willingness to bless you with anything you ask for. You see, we have to understand how much God loves us to understand how much God wants to bless us. If you think God has something against you, if you think God you know, holds his nose when he thinks of you. It's going to be hard for you to have faith for God to grant what you're praying for. Matthew 7, 11 says this. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask? It says even the people of this world who aren't even necessarily saved, they know how to give their own children good gifts. They actually love their children. They want to give them good things. It says how much more? How much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask? Because he is the perfect Father. He is the perfect Father who loves us in a perfect way, a complete way that is beyond any other love we could ever know. So this verse says, how much more will your heavenly Father give to those who ask? There's a question. How much? How much more? What's the quantity? Well, the first thing to recognize about that is it says, how much more? It doesn't just say how much, how much more. In other words, you can expect from your heavenly father something that is a much greater measure than a human father would give you. So in other words, God gives a greater abundance and we should expect more, not less, because this is God's nature towards us, because God loves us so much. So how much more? How much more? How, how can you quantify that? I'm going to say this. Uh, here's a good way of of saying and explaining how much more. It's found in Ephesians 3, 320. It says this, now to him, it's talking about our father in heaven, who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. How much more? Well, I'll tell you what, how much more? More than you could even ask, more than you could even, even think, but it says, depending upon something. It says, according to the power that is at work within us. Did you catch that? What is this power that needs to be working within us for us to get the great increase? Do you want to guess what that power is? Do you want to guess what that power is that it's saying needs to be working in you for you to see a great increase? Well, you might think that it's faith. Faith, if I have more faith, I get more and I get better results and I yield a, a greater harvest. That's what you might be thinking, but that would be incorrect because that's not what it's talking about. So what is this power that it is talking about in that verse? It is also found in the book of Ephesians. It's also found in chapter three. In fact, it's found in the verse just prior to the verse we just read. So I'm going to read Ephesians 3.19 and 3.20 together. It says, and to know, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. You're going to know something that is beyond knowledge, more than you can ask or think. How can you know something beyond knowledge? Because you don't know it with your head. You know it with your spirit. So it says to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Why? That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do infinitely more than we ask or think according to his power that works within us. What power? According to that knowledge of his love in you. That knowledge of Christ's love for you will cause you to produce a greater harvest. Love is the answer. The measure of our knowledge concerning the love of Christ for us will produce the measure of results we get when we ask in faith. 1 John 5, 14 through 15 says this, And this is the confidence that we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we already possess what we have asked of him. This is the confidence we have, it says. Now, that sounds like a kind of faith, doesn't it? Well, it is a type of faith. 
but is a type of faith that comes from a confidence in something. And it's not in God's ability, but in God's great love for us. Knowing how much God loves you will make you confident, and that will manifest in great faith for whatever you ask. If you really love somebody, if you really, really love somebody, how hard is it to deny them when they ask you for something they need? Now, just think of that. They need, they need, they need food. They need water. Uh, you know what? You're not going to say, no, I love you, but I'm not going to give it to you. Because of the love in you, you are going to give it to them. Uh, you know, and when you really, really love somebody, you're not only concerned with what they need, but you're also concerned with what they want. And God's concerned about that in our lives. He's actually concerned about what we want as long as it is good for our lives. John 16, 24 says this, until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. The Lord says, I want your joy to be full. I want you to have, but I need you to ask. So love for some is a hard thing to grasp. I get that. Uh, it's a hard thing for them to receive. I get that. They're not even sure that it's really real because they haven't experienced it from other humans before. And because of that, it can be difficult for some people to grasp this kind of faith based on this kind of love because they're not even sure. Is that love a fantasy? Uh, it's certainly not anything I've experienced, but God wants you to experience his love. He wants you to experience it in a greater measure than you've ever experienced it before. And as you begin to experience his love in a greater and a greater marriage, your faith will become greater and greater and produce greater and greater results. So I think we'd all agree with this. God is real. Start with that fact. God is real. Well, if God's real, then let's also agree on this. Since God is real and the Bible says God is love, then love has to be real too, doesn't it? This kind of love that I'm talking about has to be real too if God's real. So what does his love look like? Well, it is expressed in the greatest act of love that has ever been demonstrated, which is in the giving of his son, Jesus Christ to pay the price for our sins. John 3, 16 and 17 says this, for God so loved the world. And let's not forget this. He loved the world while they were still sinners. This is, this is not something that he loved us after we got saved. He loved us even before we were saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That is the greatest act of love. But what is the best description of what this love looks like? Let's try to describe this kind of love that God has. We find the best description in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. And I'm going to read those verses to you. Love is patient and kind. You know, wherever you find the word love in this particular uh, verse, you can also substitute the word God. If God is love and love is patient and kind. Then guess what? God is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no records of wrongs being done to it. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. That is the nature of God's kind of love. God's love finds no fault in you. He keeps no record of your wrongs. He believes all things. He keeps a positive attitude towards you. He hopes in all situations for you. He endures in every trial with you. God never, ever allows his love for you to fail. Not even for a moment. His love will never fail for you. you know, even if you hate God, he cannot stop being who he is. And he is love. Is this kind of love hard for you to produce so that you can begin to produce this kind of love so that you can see the, the great results in your life when you sow your seeds. You know, I'm, I'm going to try to get my love on that level. I'm going to try to get my love to God's level. I'm going to try to get my love to be more patient. I'm going to work on that thing. I'm going to try for it to be less jealous, boastful, proud, and rude. I'm going to work on that thing. That's, that's a mindset that we get. We're going to work on this, but it's really is not so much a matter of doing as it is a matter of receiving. You can only give what you have received. And God gives you his love so that you can both give it and have it for yourself. 1 John 4, 18 says this, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And the word perfect means complete.
If you walk around with a fear of punishment hanging over your head, you're not going to be walking in an atmosphere of God's love, which produces confidence and faith. And we want to be walking in an atmosphere of God's love so that we can be walking in an atmosphere of confidence and faith so that when we pray and when we sow those seeds, God can cause our harvest to be great as well. We are God's children. We are made in his image and likeness. We have been made perfect by the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. But somehow we've allowed ourselves many times to fall for a lie. We have received a false report from the enemy. We have accepted uh, things in our heart that were told to us from an unreliable source because the Bible is the only reliable source of knowledge. We have eaten the fruit that kills instead of the word that gives life. Every word of God that you take in and receive is life-giving and Jesus wants you and I to experience what he said was the abundant life. Now let's straighten out some of the wrong thinking and wrong believing so that we can walk in this perfect love that Jesus talks about. What does the scripture we read in 1 John really say and what does it not say? More importantly, I'll read it again. 1 John 4.18 There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Now, right away, your natural mind has just decided to make sense out of these words that I've just read. And that is our first mistake, is allowing our natural mind to make sense out of God's word. The Bible tells us that there is a teacher, a teacher that will teach us the truth of the word of God. He will give us the correct interpretation of what the scripture says. But most of us allow our natural mind to be our teacher instead of listening to the Holy Spirit, who is the true teacher of God's word. John 14, 26 says this about that teacher. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, well, he's already sent him to you and I if we're saved, will teach you all things. And he isn't going to teach you some things. He's going to teach you everything that you need to know. And he'll remind you of everything. I have said to you, Jesus said. So when you attempt to understand the scriptures by using intellect of the natural mind, you're going to have a faith problem because the, the understanding of the scriptures comes from the Holy Spirit, not from intellect. Your natural mind is in fact hostile towards God's word. It's hostile towards it because God's word cannot be understood by natural reasoning. It's far above natural reasoning. It must be accepted by faith, and then the Holy Spirit will reveal it to your spirit so that you can have the understanding that God intends. When you allow your natural mind to interpret the word of God for you, you are at that moment no different than the person who reads the Bible who doesn't even have the Holy Spirit. Because they don't have the Holy Spirit and they're letting their natural mind interpret scripture. Well, when we allow our natural mind to interpret scripture, we're getting the same kind of interpretation that they would get. And that is not what God intends. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says this, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them. You hear that? Without the Spirit, you cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. You want to know about God? You want to know about His love? You want to understand His Word? It is by the teaching of the Holy Spirit within you. It's not by the natural mind in the processes of intellect. When you allow your flesh to call the shots, it's going to rule against the things of the Spirit because the things of the Spirit are never going to satisfy the reasonings of the flesh. The one is hostile against the other, and we find that in Romans 8, 5 through 7. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded or fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God or hostile against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So natural thinking will keep you earthbound. Isaiah 55, 9 says this, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I like the way 1 Corinthians 1.25 puts it. It says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. When we put the natural mind in its place, in its proper place, which is subject to the Spirit of God, then we begin to see things in the proper light. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9-13 through 13 say this, 
However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those that love him, these are the things that God has revealed to us by his spirit, not by our minds, by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. Did you hear that? We've been given the Spirit. You know, we could say there's all kinds of reasons that God gave us a spirit so it could keep us in line, keep us in check so that he could remind us of things we need to do. But this verse focuses on a specific thing that's quite interesting. It says, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. You see, we have to understand how much God loves us and what he has freely given us. We need to begin to have faith in his goodness, faith in his love for us, faith in his desire to do good to his children. When you begin to have that kind of faith, you can plant the mustard seed faith and you can see great results, 30, 60, 100 fold. Often our greatest battles take place in our mind. So let's look again at what 1 John really says. Let's look at it with letting the spirit kind of give us an interpretation that's a little bit deeper than the surface interpretation that we can get from our natural mind. 1 John 4.18 says this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect or complete in love. So here's the truth. Perfect love that is spoken of here can only come from one source. Perfect love. Think about that. Who has perfect love? Do you have perfect love? Do I have perfect love? Well, not uh, on our own. It's not something we have produced. It's not something I have tried my best to get my love perfect. Perfect love is of God, and God is the one that gives perfect love. We can allow God to manifest this perfect love through us to others. And in that sense, we have become conduits, but we're still not the source. You see, God wants to work through you. He wants to live through you so that people can see Christ in you. So they don't see you anymore. They see Christ in you. And God's perfect love can flow through you. We can allow God to manifest this perfect love through us towards others, but we don't manufacture it. We are just conduits of this kind of love, but God wants us to be conduits. We're not the source. God is our source. But guess what? The source lives within us. God lives within me and within you, and therefore perfect love can flow from within you to without. We are vessels of the Holy Spirit. We are not the Holy Spirit himself, but we are his vessels. We can do the works of the Spirit and allow the Spirit to work through us and manifest in signs and wonders and miracles and healings, but it's the Holy Spirit doing the work. It's not us, but we allow him to do it through us. So how do we achieve this state that we've been talking about of having perfect love? The kind of love that creates the necessary environment for our seeds to produce the greatest crop. I mean, what do we have to do? Well, you know something? The answer is the same to every question we can ask, which is this. What do you do? What do you do? You know, what do I have to do to become a better person to get saved? Do else? You know, the, the answer is really this. Jesus did it all. You can do nothing but have faith in the Son of God. All the glory is going to go to Jesus, not to us. It's not by our own, own great works, our own great faith that we have accomplished our salvation. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. And he even gave us that faith so that we could exercise it. So all glory goes to Jesus for everything good, including having perfect love flowing through us. That comes from Jesus. We're the recipients of God's goodness. And sometimes we're honored enough to be able to carry that goodness to others and become a vessel or a conduit for his goodness. But in the end, it's all from him. It's through him. It's for his glory. Now, do you want to begin to walk in this atmosphere of perfect love? Well, then you must begin to change your thinking now. The perfect love that drives out all fear is not something that you're supposed to be able to produce. It's simply something that you are able to receive. God wants to give you his perfect love. He wants you to experience his perfect love. He wants you to flow in his perfect love and have no doubt of his perfect love for you so that you can thrive in the environment of God's perfect love. We are vessels of the new wine, but we don't produce the new wine. We are open vessels willing to be filled with the new wine, but we are not the source of the new wine. When we begin to make it 
our daily practice, our daily aim to meditate on how much God loves us, on how much he has done for us because of that love, on how much he has provided for us because of that love, on how much he has prepared for us because of that love, how much he has protected us and nurtured us because of that love, how much he has cherished us and how much more he intends to do for us because of that great love. It will open up the ability within your heart to believe for anything. It'll create an environment where mustard seed faith can thrive and nothing will get in its way. So when we begin to meditate on God's love, when we begin to dwell on God's love, his perfect love, his overwhelming love for us, when we look at every situation through the lens of God's perfect love, we're not going to have fear. Fear is not going to be able to be present because we're going to have this complete trust for the one who loves us so much and understand that everything that we see in our life through this lens of love, we understand that God is allowing certain things and doing certain things and moving certain things and bringing certain things into our life because it's a good plan that is for our benefit. It is because he loves us. His love will cause you to be confident. The perfect love that drives out fear is the love that God has for us that we've received into our hearts. To the measure you receive his love, you're gonna be able to demonstrate this love to others. So where does fear come from? Where does fear reside? Fear cannot reside in your spirit because God has joined your spirit and there's no fear in God. So where's fear come from? It resides in your natural mind, once again. That's sometimes your enemy, your biggest enemy, sometimes just your own thoughts. Begin to understand that looking at things through the lens of the natural thinking is the very thing the enemy wants you to do because it's going to keep you defeated. It's going to keep you questioning God's love for you. The enemy knows that it is in your natural mind that he gets to cause you to see things through a worldly perspective that is absent of God's love. And he keeps you from seeing uh, things in the way that God wants you to see them so that you can receive all that God has intended for you. The enemy gets you to believe that you're a dog under the table begging for the crumbs of the master and, and taking away the understanding that actually you're a son sitting at the table and the father has given you everything to eat freely of. Your heavenly father not only can do above all that you can ask or think, but he wants to do above all that you can ask or think because of his great love for you. He completely, perfectly loves you beyond all human comprehension. You need to accept that. You need to begin to say it's true. Even if I don't fully grasp it, I'm going to agree with what God says about himself. God is love and God loves me. God loves me perfectly. God loves me beyond comprehension. God loves me in a crazy kind of way that's beyond any human uh, understanding or reasoning because that's how he loves you. He loves you completely. You believe in God, that's a good start. But don't forget, God is love. Believe in God's love. To the degree that you can begin to receive his unfathomable love for you, this will determine the degree of the harvest that is produced in your faith life as you pray. The harvest is going to be directly correlated to the understanding of God's love for you because it's in the atmosphere of God's love for you, your faith can be unhindered. Fear will not have a place. And that faith and that love will cause the seeds that you plant in faith to produce the greatest harvest. And that's the harvest God wants you to have. He doesn't wanna give you less. He wants to give you abundantly above all that you can ask or think. Where do we begin? You begin to dwell on his love for you. And if you begin to dwell on his love for you, if you make this a daily practice, if you begin to say, I don't care what the natural man says or what my mind reasons, I accept what God says about me. I accept that he does love me that much. When you begin to accept that love, you will begin to operate in a level of faith you've never seen before. First John 4, 16 says this, and we have known and believed the love that God has to us. It says, we've known and we believe the love that God has to us. God is love. And he that dwells in love, that means you're constantly abiding in it. You're meditating on it. He who dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. So what's the perfect atmosphere for the greatest harvest? It's the atmosphere of God's love for you. Receive it. Embrace it. Make it yours because it belongs to you and God has given it to you freely. God bless you.
I pray that this has really benefited you today. Uh, go back, look at the scriptures, meditate on the word, and let it soak in. And let the Holy Spirit be a teacher and reveal to you how much God really loves you. Thank you for joining us today. I'm going to turn it over now to my wife for a closing prayer. Amen. Good morning. I thought I'd show you our other furry family member, Mochi. Mochi's actually older than Henry, but I thought since Henry got so much uh, critical acclaim and, and feedback that maybe you'd like to see Mochi. So let's go ahead and close the service with a little prayer. Father, thank you so much that you are getting us all through this time. And Father, I pray that as we join together again soon, Father, that we will have a fresh appreciation for all things and do not take any of our liberties for granted. Lord, I thank you that we will be more considerate of one another. And I thank you, Father, that you are growing our church and growing our people. And Father, for all that are tuning into this, to this YouTube, Lord, I pray that you would just meet needs and where there are areas of lack, Father, that you would supply those areas abundantly because you're such a good and loving Father. We thank you, Lord, that you are the author and the finisher of our faith and that you have the final say-so and the final word. And we thank you, Lord, that we know how the story ends. It's always a good ending where Jesus is involved. So Father, thank you that you are healing and touching the lives of all the people that are affected by the pandemic. Lord, I just pray that jobs be restored for better jobs, Lord. Uh, Father, I pray that finances, uh, bodies, everything be healed, Lord, and that we come back together again very soon with the joy that we've been given in Christ Jesus, amen. Have a good rest of your Sunday. Bye.